Okay, perfect. So maybe we're going to start. Uh, it's our great pleasure to have Nick Mulder with us today. Um, this event is organized by the Global Governance Center, which we thank for uh, bringing Nick uh, to town. Um, it's uh, uh, also our pleasure to announce a new initiative that actually uh, as you can uh, see on uh, the institute website, is that we, we started a sanctions for sustainable peace hub at the institute, uh, uh, where I have to thank Shirin uh, Barol for putting up the website. If you're interested in the topic of sanction, that would be the entry, the portal through which you can enter to all uh, sanctions related research at the Institute. And you will see uh, the faculty uh, who is uh, working on topics, the researchers, the publication, the PhD thesis, and even the MFSs. We have a, a good number of MFSs dealing with issues uh, around sanctions. Um, and today we will have a discussion, uh, Farzan Sabeh, uh, uh, who is a UN official, a UNIDIR uh, senior researcher, uh, working on uh, nuclear uh, politics in the Middle East, and who has uh, worked for a long time on sanctions, and is still working on sanctions uh, uh, as part of, uh, of a project I finished on bombs, banks, and sanctions, which was funded by the European Research Council for five years. So sanctions uh, are now everywhere in the media, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, not a good news for the world, but I think it was a good news for, for the launch of Nick's uh, book, which is really an excellent academic book, which I highly recommend to any historian or sociologist interested in expertise, the building of uh, transnational uh, uh, legal orders, international economic uh, law, and uh, 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 history of finance in general. Uh, Nick uh, is an assistant professor in history at Cornell. He graduated from Columbia University, did his uh, dissertation, from which the book is uh, a transformation uh, at Columbia University with Mark Mazower and Adam Tools, uh, two prominent historians, uh, one of the interwar, uh, the other both of the interwar actually, uh, one more in uh, intellectual history, the other one uh, financial history. Uh, and so it's really a pleasure to welcome uh, Nick and to hear your views that will be beyond the book. Uh, so you have 30 minutes, then Farzan will uh, take uh, 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 the discussion and then we'll open the discussion to the group. Great. Well, thank you very much, Kegler, for the wonderful introduction and uh, thank you all for coming uh, for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be back in Geneva. Uh, a whole lot of the book actually is based on research that was done here. And I saw yesterday the United Nations Archives announced that a lot of the League of Nations files are now digitized. So I do hope that people will continue to make the trek uh, to do that. Um, but it's really nice to uh, be back here. Uh, and of course, the book, uh, which is predominantly about the interwar period and the League of Nations, um, is also set uh, for large parts of its narrative in Geneva and the discussions that were held there about the history of sanctions. I'm not going to summarize it so much as take a few parts of the argument and the analysis and develop those a little bit. Um, and I'm particularly um, going to focus on putting the history of sanctions side by side with uh, another narrative, which we hear a lot about in the news these days, which is the history of globalization. And when globalization in its own form took off and how sanctions and globalization interact, because we're at a pretty tense and uh, fraught moment right now, and a lot of questions about the future of globalization are, I think, easier to answer when we understand what sanctions do and do not do to interdependence. Um, and interdependence is really one of the key concepts uh, that I'll be talking about. I want to start with someone that many of you might know. Uh, he actually went to high school here in the late 19th century, um, Norman Angel. Um, he's very well known as a journalist, uh, he also won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1933, was a major internationalist of the late 19th and early 20th century, and a big uh, commentator at the time, uh, uh, sort of the equivalent of a, a Tom Friedman uh, for the fantasy icon. And Angel um, 
wrote uh, a book that uh, many of you may know him uh, best for, Europe's Optical Illusion, uh, which has also been rendered the, uh, the Great Illusion. Uh, and he wrote this in 1909, and it was a big panoramic view of how interdependent the world had gotten right before uh, the First World War. And it's oftentimes used by historians as a, a kind of way of describing uh, the splendor of that period, but also the naivete of thinking that such an interconnected world uh, would survive. And Angel, in a sense, becomes the butt of a lot of historians' narratives because only three or four years after this book came out, World War I began. But actually, Angel, I think, was a much more acute analyst of globalization than we've given him credit for. And he understood that it has both a lot of potential, but that it also um, has dangers in it, particularly when countries try to exploit globalization for political ends. Um, one year into the First World War, he wrote a book which is much less known, but no less interesting to read, called The World's Highway. And its subtitle was Some Notes on America's Relation to Sea Power and Non-Military Sanctions for the Law of Nations. And what he did in this book, he was very quick after World War I broke out to um, correct his arguments uh, in Europe's optical illusion. And in that book, he had claimed that the world had become so interdependent, countries were so enmeshed with each other, that going to war was not impossible, it would merely be very destructive and very foolish. And he said, from a rational point of view, there's no real reason why anyone would want to go to war, why aggression should survive in such an interdependent world. After World War I broke out, of course, it, it um, became clear that that was not necessarily uh, the case, that there were still uh, raison d'etat state reasons for waging war. But Angel very quickly updated his analysis, and he perceived something in the war itself that was very prescient, and that actually is a big insight, I think, into the whole history of sanctions from then until now. Um, he described the use of economic war, of the blockade that was being used by the Allies as follows. He said, it gives a mere hint of what the organized isolation by the entire world would mean to any one nation. Imagine the position of a civilized country whose ports no ship from another country would enter, whose bills no banker would discount, a country unable to receive a telegram or a letter from the outside world or sent there to, whose citizens could neither travel in other countries or maintain communications therewith. We might have little conception of the terror with which such a policy might constitute to a nation, but if this machinery of non-intercourse were organized as it might be, there would be virtually no neutrals, and its effect in our world today would be positively terrifying. And what Angel here outlined was the what would become the dominant view of economic sanctions in the interwar period, which was that if you could use this blockade instrument, cutting off countries from their links with the outside world, um, and if you could threaten to use this, if an international organization had this instrument at its disposal, then they could hopefully influence policymakers and prevent them from even considering going to war. So this was a way of preventing wars before they broke out, making it clear what the economic damage of going to war would be. And if the consequences were spelled out clearly enough, then any rational nation, any rational government uh, would uh, restrain its aggressive impulses and world peace would be preserved. And this was the idea that the League of Nations would take up. And uh, when the League of Nations was founded and established here in Geneva, um, at the end of World War I, it had one article, Article 16, which had something that effectively uh, read a lot like this passage from Engel, that if the League Council found a country to be uh, an aggressor state, the whole rest of the League would come together and isolate it. And this was the first international interstate mechanism for imposing economic sanctions. And the book tells the story of that mechanism, which was known as the economic weapon. That was how people at the time called it. So it's interesting to note here this was a policy that was modeled on the blockade of the First World War. It had its origins in the war. And nowadays, also the use of the term sanctions, it's very legalistic. It makes us think about law and lawyers and formal court-like procedures. But this was modeled on a very active and coercive state policy uh, that was economic war. And uh, Angel had a more a, a positive gloss on it. He said, if we organize this successfully, we can... Uh, Create what he called an economic world state. Um, but at the time, the economic weapon was what was foremost at, in the minds of policymakers. And I said that Angel was a quite acute analyst of some of the tensions in this proposal. And indeed, he himself already foresaw one of the possible 
drawbacks of organizing things this way. He said the outstanding defect of his plan is that the strong international currents which division of trade and labor, irrespective of frontiers, have in the last few generations set up would be deliberately checked, so deliberate interference with interdependence. The activities of men which have in the recent past so largely disregarded frontiers will be organized so as to take very considerable regard for frontiers. Nations will tend to become, under such an arrangement, what they have not been of late, economic, social, and moral units. And there might result between nations a sort of competition for self-sufficingness, which, ill-directed, might conceivably end in buttressing the nationalism which was on the cost of the war. So here, Angel foresaw that if uh, the countries uh, were to be molded by being severed from globalization into economic and political units, then actually they would uh, potentially also become more aggressive, that this would uh, have a possible counterproductive outcome. Um, it would actually intensify divisions. Um, and so Angel himself was in a way the most acute critic of sanctions right at the beginning too. He, this is all in, um, in this early book. Um, but uh, what's interesting here is to quickly move through uh, the interwar period, which I'll do now, and then I'll end with some notes about uh, sanctions and globalization uh, today. Um, so the blockade of Central Europe, which was organized by the Allies, was a very vast undertaking. It was organized by uh, specific ministries of blockade that were created, new ministries in the French and British governments that had large amounts of civil servants and bureaucrats working for them. And they became essential um, to managing this blockade, and many of them became policymakers or advisors in the League of Nations, actually. So that's where the expertise of how to use blockade was also the expertise that was used to craft sanctions. Uh, this was about controlling trade flows, and interdependence in this period had reached a dramatic uh, height. Um, I'll come back to this graph in a moment, but what it shows is the increase of world trade over the course of the long 19th century. And this is also why sanctions in their, as an international peacekeeping device emerged at this point and not earlier, um, because in the 19th century, there was economic war. There were Napoleonic blockades, uh, there were uh, economic blockades earlier on, but this didn't happen in a world where trade was so vital to nations across the board, where entire societies had become dependent on food from other countries, for example. So something qualitatively uh, changed in the 19th century. It was at first a quantitative change, but over time, that quantitative change became a qualitative change. And uh, it's only with that really deep and new form of interdependence that sanctions become thinkable. Um, so. At the end of the First World War, as I said, uh, the imbalance and the potential power that this control over resources had given the Allies was really stark. In the left-hand column, you can see uh, the um, shares and the absolute amounts of annual production of a number of key commodities. Uh, actually, if you read the news now, uh, and there's talk about sanctions and globalization, uh, we're now actually returning to a moment where this sort of overview is coming back, even the European Commission recently drafted uh, an overview of what sort of key materials Europe doesn't have and how many of them are in which alliance. Uh, so the whole discussion about French shoring, for example, uh, directly engages with these sorts of overviews. But this was already made in 1918 as well. So this is from one of the blockade ministries. Um, and if you put all the countries that controlled uh, these resources in the left-hand column, the allied and associated powers, which included also the United States together, this was a very uh, potent coalition. And the countries in green that you can see on this map were the ones that joined the League of Nations. The US, importantly, was not part of that because the Versailles Treaty, of course, was rejected uh, by the American Senate, but all the other countries did join, and that still gave a pretty preponderant share of global resources to uh, the League of Nations. So any country that was going to try um, and aggressively conquer territory faced with this organization had a pretty a tough challenge ahead if the economic weapon was used. And just recall that the original idea was that simply spelling out how overwhelming that power to impose deprivation was would be enough. So the idea was that sanctions were a deterrent. The most successful sanctions, the League Internationalists believed, would not have to be used. You simply made it clear what the consequences would be, and any sensible government would then uh, choose to engage in diplomacy, would become prepared to negotiate. 
Um, and indeed, it seemed uh, during a number of diplomatic crises in the 1920s, particularly, that there was some reason uh, for uh, thinking that this would be true, that this deterrence idea or the theory behind sanctions would work. The first case was in uh, November 1921, when uh, Yugoslavia, one of the new states saved by uh, the Paris Peace Treaties, tried to uh, take a little part of northern Albania, uh, where the border had not yet been defined. And very quickly, the League of Nations threatened to use sanctions against Yugoslavia, and they backed down. So this seemed merely with the threat to have worked to keep peace in the Balkans. After all, the Balkans had been where the First World War started with an assassination. So keeping peace in the Balkans was actually considered a pretty important uh, quality and uh, potentially, again, an area where a new sort of geopolitical crisis could emerge. Another Balkans determined uh, success by sanctions was a border war in late 1925 between Greece and Bulgaria. This is the Greek general uh, Theodoros Pangalos, who was the military dictator of Greece at the time, and when he was threatened in a very similar way with sanctions, he also chose to accept mediation by the League of Nations. There are fascinating documents here in the archives about this whole crisis. Um, and these two incidents led to the belief that, indeed, if the League of Nations showed what it was capable of, and if a threat to impose sanctions was clearly communicated, then it was possible to preserve peace. But there were a few crucial caveats and uh, characteristics of these incidents that made it difficult to generalize this success. Of course, these were very small countries. They were very dependent on uh, large trading partners. Some of them, Yugoslavia, was virtually uh, landlocked or locked at least into the Adriatic. So um, it was difficult uh, to um, think that this might necessarily work against larger states. And that was the big challenge of the 1930s when countries like fascist Italy, uh, militarist Japan and Nazi Germany began to expand and take over other territories. Then the challenge was, can a large state be deterred from the threat of sanctions? And here things became much more difficult. So now we're doing some time. Um, I'll just move through uh, this. Um, but what I want to I'll talk a little bit about now is uh, what happened in the 1930s, because this was a very famous crisis um, of, of globalization, the Great Depression took place. And if you ask economic historians or any economists, they'll, they'll tell you that the 1930s were a period of deglobalization, where everything fell apart. Now, I want to just return to this graph that I showed you before, because it's quite important here to be quite specific about what constitutes globalization and deglobalization. If you look at trade, there's a significant growth throughout the 19th century. And uh, the First World War in 1913, uh, roughly here, uh, leads to a temporary dip. And then in the 1920s, there is a recovery. So the growth rate of world trade in the 1920s is actually 5.3%, much higher than in any other uh, period. So there's a significant recovery. And by the late 20s, uh, early 30s, uh, world trade actually is much, much more developed than it had been before the war. The Great Depression happens, and it makes uh, the volume of trade fall back but not to any major low, but actually to the level right around what it was at the end of the fantasy actor. So we need to kind of take this into account. This was not a dramatic unraveling of everything that had been achieved um, in the 19th century. It was a temporary uh, setback, um, and it was a stop in the growth. And actually, after that, you could see, again, things were covered. So by the mid to late 1930s, again, uh, the world economy is already um, above its 1913-14 uh, level. Um, and one of the reasons is that we've focused a lot on prices, which shows a big decrease in the value of world trade. But if you look at volume, how much stuff, physical stuff, crosses borders, it's clear that the world remained extremely interdependent. And right now we're in a supply chain crisis. There's a commodity price surge. Uh, people are taking a much bigger interest in actual stuff, right, in, in uh, the physical kinds of needs um, of countries uh, that, that connect them across borders. Um, so I think that we should take this insight and apply it also um, to our view of the 1930s. In material terms, the world remained very interdependent. And um, this was also understood by people at the time. So the power to impose sanctions was actually not that diminished by the Great Depression, not nearly as much as we think. Um, so this supposed era of deglobalization actually 
uh, still meant countries were very interdependent and so sanctions could still be used. And this was also recognized by countries uh, that were aggressor states. So the uh, Minister for Foreign Exchange of Fascist Italy, uh, Felice Guarneri, said in this period that most countries have become kind of protectionist when it comes to their production, but when it comes to what they consume, the materials that they buy from abroad, they still are getting them from other countries. So they want to shield their markets, their own producers, but they still consume and import vast quantities of raw materials across borders. Um, so protectionism in the 30s is a very one-sided affair that does not actually reduce the material uh, levels of interdependence. And what happened here as a result of this, what this meant was that fascist states were vulnerable to sanctions and they were very fearful of it because they understood that if they were to go ahead with their plans for territorial conquest, that there would at some point be sanctions that would follow. Um, when Italy invaded Ethiopia in 1935, the League of Nations came together and imposed the first major multilateral sanctions regime. And the Italians rallied uh, against this. This became a big way for Mussolini to rally support uh, for his regime um, and launch a campaign for autarky, for self-sufficiency. He had already moved in this direction beforehand, but the sanctions gave him a new device with which to continue and accelerate this. And uh, around the same time, Nazi Germany, which also, of course, had uh, ambitious and aggressive plans for territorial expansion, launched its four-year plan, which explicitly tried to make it immune or resilient, the German term is blockade festi, um, to a, a blockade and the use of sanctions, which they expected could happen even without war breaking out, that the League of Nations and the Allies would simply uh, throttle their access to key commodities. And by the end of the decade, uh, the Nazis uh, also had propaganda that they issued, including this, where they said, well, in the First World War, we were still vulnerable to blockade. But by now, we have all sorts of treaties with other countries in Eastern Europe, including the Soviet Union, that make us immune. We have achieved blockade festivities, and uh, now uh, we have a new kind of power position in the world. And finally, one of the countries that was probably most dependent on imports of resources was Japan. Uh, like uh, Great Britain, it was an island state, so it necessarily got a lot of its um, important resources from other countries and overseas. And the paradox is that as Japan aggressively attacks and invades China, it actually became more and more dependent on buying a lot of its imports from the United States, which is one of the countries that had remained neutral. And uh, the more Japan advanced, the more it expanded its empire, uh, the more it began to source things like coal, iron ore, um, and also oil, uh, vital for <laughs> ships and air force and army from the United States. And this sets up this dramatic confrontation, which by the early 1940s leads to the U.S. imposing an oil embargo, and within months, Japan attacks the United States at Pearl Harbor. So a kind of spiral emerges where these aggressor states fear sanctions, they want to become more autarkic as a result, but this means that they need more resources, more territory, so they become more aggressive. This leads to further threats and impositions of sanctions, which accelerate their aggression. And you get into this vicious spiral where using the threat of sanctions actually um, in life is far from being the cause of World War II, right? This is an aggressive expansionist ideology that's at the core of it. But sanctions have a counterproductive effect of accelerating and the planning that you need to undertake if you want to wage aggressive war under these conditions. Um, and so this sanctions ultimately spiral is one of the things that I describe in the final part of the book, um, and I think it has a bunch of interesting uh, lessons or so for, for today. Um, so uh, the final uh, bit that I want to talk about now is where we've come since this interwar period, since uh, sanctions tried to exploit globalization at that time. And uh, the good news is, of course, that... Um, Globalization, however you measure it, but particularly, for example, trade as a share of the global economy has really surged. We're today many times more interdependent still than we were already in the early 20th century. Um, and um, if you look also at financial globalization and where uh, major banks and companies get their funding, this has led uh, to a concentration um, of uh, financial uh, resources uh, in the United States, and particularly access to the dollar, which is really key. 
Um, it's actually even increased since the global financial crisis of 2008. Uh, most banks have been in dollars uh, than before. Um, and this kind of financialization starts in the 1970s, um, but today it really is one of the main ways in which poor sanctions are being applied, uh, notably uh, through uh, the backdoor that the U.S. government created in 2001, uh, which was at the time justified by anti-terrorist considerations into the SWIFT uh, payment system. And this uh, backdoor has been uh, important to getting a sense of what goes on in the international banking system and having a, an extraterritorial power. Um, and the SWIFT sanctions were you know, used to sever Iran uh, from international finance in 2011, um, they've been applied to a number of North Korean banks, uh, and they were uh, applied uh, by this time, I think, about 70 to 80 percent of the Russian financial system is also uh, disconnected from uh, SWIFT since uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February. Um, so this is uh, not the only, but uh, an important conduit uh, of globalization today that is at the core of sanctions enforcement. And there are some other dimensions which I'm happy to talk about um, later. And the effect of this, and this is a picture I took uh, on a trip uh, to Iran in 2015, is of course that um, for many countries that have become very dependent on dollars, um, this is a, a, a life or death situation for their economy and it requires really serious modification um, and adaptation and serious economic crisis uh, to fashion a country into uh, some kind of model that might survive the exposure to sanctions over the long run. Um, so we have a kind of paradoxical situation where, again, we are much more financially globalized. Uh, there is a, a much larger uh, share of trade um, in, in the world economy. Uh, but there is also now, as a result of that centralization of infrastructures and payments um, and also in legal institutions, uh, a new set of uh, tools that can be used that, that were not present in the interwar period. So the ability to use sanctions has advanced, um, and uh, the potential economic costs of using sanctions for the rest of the world have gone up. Um, so I, I'd like to end as a result of that with four questions that are really future-oriented uh, that I think this whole history poses for us. And one is uh, a question about political legitimacy. With the League of Nations, instituting sanctions was easier because it only had about 50 or so members, and there were only uh, roughly 58 to 60 sovereign nations in the world in uh, the 1930s. So uh, a much uh, smaller global community, of course, a large part of uh, Asia and Africa at that time was part of European colonial empires. But today we live in a world of 200 or so nation states. So the political job of managing sanctions in such a world where there are many more sovereign political entities is correspondingly also uh, more challenging. Um, and one thing, important question is whether uh, the economic costs, for example, that we see the ripple effects in the world economy um, can be offset if uh, there is still uh, a sufficiently large region for many countries to go along. Um, and of course, um, in the United Nations, it's been very clear what the principles of international law say about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, there's a widespread consensus about the violations of territorial integrity, the attack on Ukrainian independence and sovereignty that Russia's aggression constitutes. But not as many countries have gone along in uh, translating that moral stance into uh, participation in the sanctions. So 140 or 150 countries are willing to condemn uh, the invasion of Ukraine, but only about 40 are imposing sanctions. And it's that gap, I think, that tells us something about the legitimacy of sanctions. It's not that the principle is being disputed, but the preparedness and also the ability um, to go along, which involves for many countries incurring a certain economic costs and, and shouldering, it, shouldering that burden. Uh, that's a much trickier thing for many countries to do. Um, and if we care about sanctions as a tool of enforcement, we should think quite seriously about how this burden uh, can be made more manageable uh, and also about whether this burden is worth it in every uh, case, which principles we really care about enforcing the sanctions, that we don't just use them for every sort of purpose. The other uh, concern uh, at the moment is adaptation. Um, as I said, the world economy is much more globalized. This means there are, is bigger economic damage as a result of sanctions. It also has some advantages. It means that we are able to offset some of the damage if, for example, now Europe is shifting uh, its energy supply from Russia to other places. 
there are alternatives. Um, it is possible to diversify. We talk a lot about uh, vulnerabilities, dependence, about choke points. But the world economy is also a place of opportunity where there are uh, particularly in the early 21st century, multiple producers of many commodities. They are not all as centralized um, and it is possible uh, to find uh, substitutes um, and also to create new alliances, to uh, grow new connections when some of them are severed by sanctions. Um, as sanctions continue to be used and the current tendency is a very strong increase, since uh, the 1990s, uh, every year almost uh, sees more sanctions designations than the last one. Uh, the question is, is the world economy able to bear it? I think one of the things that the Russian uh, invasion showed is that there's a big initial shock, but now over the course of a few months, some adaptation can happen. The issue is that it's much easier for rich countries to adapt because they have more resources. Uh, that they can devote to this. So Europeans, uh, Europeans can buy natural gas from other countries, but Pakistan and Bangladesh now find themselves without electricity because they are bid out of the liquefied natural gas market. So globally, again, um, this uh, really enforces uh, the income hierarchy. Um, then, of course, there's the question for IR theorists and people working on, on diplomacy and peacekeeping and important. Uh, about whether sanctions still have a deterrent effect. Is that original hope that the interpol connection have is still viable? Is it alive? Have we used sanctions so much that actually the deterrent effect is already kind of gone? And um, it's also arguable, of course, the very fact that Russia invaded Ukraine shows that despite, you know, there were many sanctions threats made um, in the months leading up because there was a clear buildup. Um, and this didn't prevent the invasion. So what does that actually mean for the deterrent effect? Um, are we now not already in a situation where we're just trying to use them for uh, attrition rather than to preempt conflicts that may, might break out in the future? Um, and can we, is there anything that we can do about the current construction of sanctions or are they necessarily too slow to be imposed, too impartial in the countries using them behind them? too weak in their effects on Russia, and perhaps also too partial that they're seen as a Western device and not as a truly international um, uh, instrument. And then finally, and I think this is one of the most uh, worrying uh, aspects as we look ahead to other potential geopolitical flashpoints, also in Asia and elsewhere, um, do sanctions today risk, uh, again, kicking off, or are we perhaps already in this sanctions autarky spiral? Is the threat of sanctions feeding uh, fortress strategies in economics, not just in Russia, but uh, in elsewhere, uh, China. Um, and uh, is there any way of preventing this gradual drift, as it now seems uh, in certain areas to be drifting, and accelerating uh, into economic block formation? Um, and how might we manage that? So um, these are some questions with which we need to finish, but I, I would like to thank you all very much for your attention and I look forward to Farzan's comments and my discussion. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Gregoire, for the kind introduction, and Nick for joining us today to discuss your book and your great uh, presentation. Um, so after spending a long time with the, the book and reading it over not only once, but going back to certain sections uh, again and again, I think um, this is one of the most important books to be written on sanctions, and less than a year after, after its release already has the quality of an instant classic, I think, um, which is kind of contradictory a little bit because it takes, sometimes it takes a while for something to become a classic. But I think one of the qualities of, of this kind of instant classic is a novelty and excellence um, in, in the way that it transforms the way we view the world, or at least a particularly important aspect of it. In the case of history, I think, and this is a history book despite the somewhat deceiving cover, um, I think an additional quality of an instant classic is to dispel our collective amnesia about something that we as historians, policymakers, the media, or the public may view as relatively recent, but in fact has a much longer lineage. Um, I think the economic weapon is brilliant in this regard in its retracing and reconstruction of the origins of economic sanctions in the interwar period between 1919 and 1939. And uh, most of the book does take place roughly between uh, 1914 and uh, 1945. And although the conclusion and the final chapter go into the periods afterwards a little bit. 
Um, at, while sanctions scholars um, and practitioners have been aware of these kind of origins of sanctions, it's often been relegated to a footnote or a quote about you know, Woodrow Wilson um, during the First World War making comments about sanctions and then it being introduced. Um, rather than just a footnote in history, though, the economic um, weapon uh, centers sanctions, um, which, uh, you know, there are different def definitions, but one, one that we often use is um, as a non-military coercive instrument used to change or constrain the behavior, the problematic behavior of a state or non-state actor or signal certain normative uh, commitments. Um, it centers um, sanctions in the pioneering efforts of the Triple Entente victors of the First World War to create a post-war global order in which interstate conflict could be restrained without the resort to war. By doing so, I think the economic weapon fills an important gap in the literature and nicely complements, I think, other excellent works um, on the interwar period and Second World War that I highly recommend, including Japan Prepares for Total War by Michael Barnard, which shows how fear among some Japanese elites uh, of the use of the economic weapon to isolate and weaken their country's uh, economy shaped not only Japan's colonial ambitions in Asia, but also it's specifically its decision to go to war with the United States in the Pacific, um, as well as the magnificent Witch's of Destruction by Adam Tooze, which shows how assessments by the German military and Adolf Hitler um, of the closing economic and resource window to wage offensive war on a large scale, I think, uh, which was partly created by the use of the economic weapon and the feared or perceived use of it, um, shaped actually the Third Reich's decision uh, to invade the Soviet Union. So I think besides changing how we view the world, another quality, a second quality of an instant classic um, is timeliness. How does it resonate with the zeitgeist? And I think as Nicholas nicely pointed out in his, uh, in his presentation, the release of this book, or true at least, at least for him, um, corresponds with uh, the imposition of sanctions on Russia. Now, uh, oftentimes these sanctions have been described or characterized as unprecedented. And I would argue in terms of the a force brought to bear and the instrument used against uh, any single state. They're not unprecedented, but that doesn't mean that their specific imposition on Russia doesn't have world historical significance. And I think it's already effect affecting our world in a number of ways, whether it's on the global economy and we, we soon see a recession, um, whether, about, uh, whether in terms of how it redirects the trajectory of globalization as we experience it, uh, something else that Nick, I think, uh, addressed in his presentation. And then how these sanctions shape or reshape global order in terms of relations of power and competition dynamics between the leading economic and military powers of the world. Um, so before heading into my questions, I also want to just make a few other observations about anyone uh, about the book for anyone who's interested in getting it. I think th something the book does uh, quite nicely is um, it's quite ambitious in scope. It's covering a fairly large, intense period of history. You wouldn't think that in 300 pages you could capture, you know, uh, First World War, Second World War, and interwar period, like roughly like 40, 30 year period there, but it somehow does it. And it, it nicely kind of does this broad sweep while also zooming in on very interesting episodes that illuminate how things are evolving um, during this time. Um, the book uh, is also, I think, quite eloquently written and masterfully um, weaves in a new cast of compelling and recognizable characters in the, for, in the form of what the book labels as the sanctionists, um, among them Robert Sissel and William Arnold Forster, um, as well as bringing in old favorites like John Maynard Keynes. So you're, there's a cast of recognizable uh, characters and new characters that I think um, it's quite enjoyable to read and drive the narrative of the, of the book forward. I think that the only aspect of this otherwise very compelling book that raised questions for me was the valiant effort by the author to rescue the League of Nations from its ignominious place in history. Um, as a decade-long resident of Geneva and UN staffer, I, I really appreciate this. Um, but often in the book, this assertion, I think, stands in stark contrast to the repeated failures of the League, despite the perceived power that the economic weapon clearly carries in the minds of not only the people considering using them, but also those who it's potentially going to be used against. Um, and, um, you know, uh, the, the League's uh, kind of uh, relegation yeah, to, to the dustbin of history. 
Although I do understand um, and appreciate the author's view of the League's value uh, as being contingent and culminating in the creation of the United Nations and sanction subsequent kind of a reassignment as just one instrument to address broad international issues among many, whether it's diplomacy or, or military action. So that, that's the one aspect, and you take quite a bit of pains to repeatedly try to kind of resuscitate the reputation of the League, but it, uh, I, think, I think besides that aspect, the, the rest of the book is wholly compelling. So uh, from here, I just want to go into a couple questions, and um, I, I've tried to formulate them as best I can, uh, but some of them may come across as a bit vague, so apologies in advance. Um, but I think, so I, 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 the three questions, I want to begin um, in the kind of colonial period, 19th century, move forward to First World War, Second World War, interwar period, and then give a more contemporary kind of oriented question. Um, the first question has to do with kind of your view as a historian of European um, and intellectual history. Uh, whether you can tell me uh, about antecedents to what we have, that we have for economic sanctions, um, in the era preceding the First World War, particularly used by the world-spanning European empires, whether against one another um, or local peoples. I think one of the cases that you very prominently raised in the early parts of the book is the Napoleon's continental system. It's, it's more in kind of a conflict or war dynamic. So what were, what were the sanctions instruments or sanctions-like instruments or potential, potential antecedents in the colonial period? So. Uh, can we can we take this debate even further back, or no? Do we have to view it as a uniquely twentieth century phenomenon? Um, second question. Um, again, this this is going to be a little bit of a long one to, to frame, but um, and I think it's to some extent related to to the first one. I think you do a great job in your book of tracing the drive by Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan for economic security, uh, security partly through conquest of resources um, that they require to run their economies and withstand economic pain and coercion, as well as carry forward various military plans that they have. Um, but this was not actually like a very new necessarily experience, either for Germany or Japan. And the drive for conquest and resources to deal with strategic insecurity and, and a sense of encirclement um, actually, to some extent, uh, predated the Second World War, right? Um, um, going back at least as far back as the mid 19th century, right? So stepping back and thinking about these conquests in broader terms, um, whether it's the Nazi New Order and General Plan Ost, which is the German plan to ethnically cleanse and colonize Eastern Europe, um, or uh, the Japanese Greater Cocoa Prosperity Sphere and plans to colonize and destroy and create a Japanese uh, kind of uh, regional bloc. Uh, how much um, are these broader efforts purely a function of economic anxiety from sanctions versus driven by a combination of the older forces which drove 19th century colonialism, as well as these newer impulses of 20th century nationalism and racialism? Uh, or just to rephrase it much more simply, are sanctions a primary force in the Japanese uh, and German drive for revisionism of global order and empire? or merely an accelerant on top of the fire. And finally, and this one will be much shorter, um, thinking about global order and revisionism in a 20th, 1st century context, and again, I think the last the questions you pose, and I think much of your presentation speak to this, but I actually want to turn them on you and have, have you give a, give a kind of crack at answering them. Um, how much do you see the powerful sanctions that we see imposed by the United States, uh, to a lesser extent, the European uh, Union and United Nations today, on the rest of the world? driving uh, like a primary uh, driver of revisionist global order building by powers like China, Russia, and even smaller states like Iran and Venezuela? And can you give us, whether it's predictions or thought about thoughts about how these are developing or how they could develop? Thank you. Great. Um, should I first just order? Yeah. Um, thank you, Farzan. Uh, so that's a, that's a lot. So I'll, I'll try and focus on, on your questions. Uh, and uh, you, what you said before is also very rich, but now I'll, I'll stick with the questions um, for now, and then we can get into more later. Um, so the antecedents of sanctions, this is in, in part of, about how you define it, right? And any book in order to tell a story about something needs to define its object. And the use of economic pressure to make people do things that they don't want to do is something that exists in many domains. So we need to actually you know, define it a bit more clearly. 
to tell it the story. And the way that I define it in the book is that sanctions are an instrument that is used in peacetime so that it should be different from just using all sorts of pressure when you're waging all out war. Because that seems quite logical, right? That since the beginning of, uh, of states, and since the beginning of human conflict, people have used all sorts of levers to try and win in conflict. That's not new and it's not surprising, but why is it possible for there to be so many sanctions today between countries and used between countries that are not in a formal state of war, right? Why, why, this, why has the use of economic pressure against civilian societies been decoupled from a state of war? That's the first thing. So the peacetime quality of them. And then there's uh, what I already talked about a little bit in the talk, that you need to also define some kind of material threshold. And again, if you read Thucydides, indeed, there are measures that the Athenians took to try and make other city-states that didn't uh, fall into line do what they wanted to do in, in antiquity. But this is still something that's a bit different from using sanctions as a tool of international order, right? We're here also in a global governance um, of the capital. And the thing, the, the quality that they have in the world today, many sanctions, even the ones that are used only by one country, say the US sanctions on um, a, a, a country like Venezuela, there are some EU sanctions on that as well, but a lot of the sanctions that are not multilateral uh, ones, they still usually are used with reference to some sort of global norm, like human rights or uh, electoral fairness or non-proliferation treaties, international treaties. So this is about the enforcement of global norms and sanctions as a tool of international order. Um, and if you think, if you take those things together, the enforcement of international order without going to war, right? This is not about uh, what are valid reasons to use self-defense, et cetera, international intervention. Uh, it's policing, in a sense, and enforcement. Um, and that countries actually need to be, that this needs to have some sort of tangible effect on, on entire societies. And I think that's key too, because Yes, the papal embargoes of the Middle Ages, too, can be thought of as a form of sanctions when the Pope would uh, excommunicate certain bishops or members of the religious community. But oftentimes, this was merely a formal condemnation. It didn't mean that the material life of countries was overstated. It did sometimes, um, but oftentimes it was merely a kind of signaling of condemnation. So it's a form of sanction or a form of ban, right? Um, and there's a very interesting book um, uh, also by Stefan Stanchev about medieval and papal embargoes and about the medieval Mediterranean <laughs> and that goes into this. But I would still say that that's a, something that's a little bit different from how we think of sanctions being used uh, today because there's a pre-existing community already. Uh, and outside that community, when the Pope uh, tries to ban trade with the Ottoman Empire, for example, it very quickly leads to war. It's the beginning of the war between a Christian and, and, and Muslim states. So um, that's one thing about the antecedents. Um, and I'll, I'll take your final two questions together because they're kind of about this question, which is indeed, right, one of the, I, I guess, more controversial aspects of the book is that it suggests that liberal, insofar as sanctions are a liberal instrument, they can backfire quite dramatically so. They can, uh, in fact, accelerate uh, and uh, bring about what they seek to prevent which is the advent of war. And I think that it's, it's important, again, uh, I, I tried in the book to be careful in making that claim in the right way, because I don't want to be misinterpreted. It's not the case that sanctions are responsible for the aggression. They don't um, totally force the hand or something, right? We need to give agency to aggressors because they, they make the decision ultimately to attack other countries. But um, having said that, it is important to not isolate aggressors and to think that every time some war breaks out, this is only because of in reasons that are internal to a country or let alone uh, reduce this to the psychology of individual leaders or dictators. We need to take a broad view, uh, think about the international system as a whole. What does the world look like from other places? And can we actually give an account how misperception uh, and secure and perceptions of insecurity play a role in why states go to war with each other. And that's simply a very basic analytical challenge, but it's an important one because that's actually what it, I think, <coughs> explaining why conflict happens, um, what, what that requires, right? Um, and for historians particularly, we can move beyond the immediate kind of moral heat of some of those discussions 
um, and now study sources from different perspectives and, and, and try and provide a slightly more, not objective, but intersubjective view of how these processes of escalation take place. So that's what I try and do in the book. And the result of that analysis is to say that there were already plans for uh, empire building and uh, territorial revision indeed in places like Japan and Germany. They are late 19th century empire building states. They, they're kind of late in the game of European imperialism. Um, but some of the things that happened in the meantime, particularly World War I and its outcome, Germany loses a lot of its colonies uh, and so effectively, the, although there are attempts by Germany to regain its old colonies, what the radical nature of Nazism is about is to try and expand that colonial empire, not in uh, the, the global south, in Africa and Asia, but in Eastern Europe. And to try and create a zone around Germany that is economically <laughs> sufficient. And what that then requires is a massive conquest and indeed ethnic uh, engineering and ethnic cleansing. So um, it's a combination of how there is a long-term agenda, but events do shape the form taken, uh, right? The policy does shift. The ultimate goal is the same, but the lengths to which uh, both Germany and Japan are willing to go to achieve those goals, uh, they radicalize uh, from the uh, 20s and 30s onward. Um, and that, I think, is not a controversial, but that's actually kind of the consensus position uh, among historians. Um, but we need to, um, you know, if you read the, the um, meetings of the German uh, high command at the time of the League of Nations sanctions, and the League of Nations, right, has been portrayed as, as weak, ineffective. Indeed, this Mussolini wasn't stopped by these sanctions. So it's very easy to conclude, oh, well, you know, it was a house of cards. But if you read the meetings of the German High Command in 1935-1936, they think of sanctions as a sword of Damocles. That's the term that they use. Uh, basically a very powerful weapon that is hanging over their heads. The League is showing that it can use it in the case of Italy and Ethiopia. So uh, Germany better be prepared to run that gamut and to incur that damage if it's going to realize its plans. And they take it extremely seriously. So. This is the paradox, and this is what we can now see by studying sources from multiple perspectives. What, from the point of view of liberal internationalism, looks like a failure is actually still perceived as a policy that is very potent and that requires um, a further steps. And this is a big question right now, right, for everyone. It are uh, the factions within China that want to reunify China and Taiwan and invade Taiwan potentially deterred by the Western sanctions from Russia or not? And it's an open question, but it's possible, and we don't have any insight into those discussions. And I think that it's probably a debate between two factions about what, how these sanctions should be interpreted. So I don't want to foreclose that, and I think that's what makes the current moment so uh, important. But we need to think about how that message is going to land and how we make sure that the right interpretation prevails. But there is no guarantee that these sanctions will lead to the right interpretation, because they enter into the mindset of policymakers with a pre-existing worldview. And if you're inclined to feel insecure and feel that you're under time pressure to do something, whether it's secure food for Germans or reunify uh, China and Taiwan, then there are two ways of doing either you back down, but you can also speed things up. And so in that sense, it's not a primary driver, it's an accelerant, but accelerating uh, can be the difference between one piece. So thanks. Maybe we open to questions. Hi, um, thank you, thank you, Nicholas, for this great and stimulating talk. Um, I have to say I haven't read the book, so the issue I'm going to raise may be treated in the book. But uh, so your story, your narrative uh, has focused mainly on on the on what was going on on trade, yeah, right, and the globalization of trade. But another aspect that did not came uh, that came very late at the end of your presentation and for a later period about globalization is the financial markets. Um, so a lot of historians have shown that also uh, by this period, financial globalization was as, in, as if at its heights. And the role that you described later for the dollar and the US at that time was played differently by the pound and England. Um, um, also, I mean, on and, and financial, there is a history of this also, that financial and access to capital market could be also an important weapon, an economic weapon to push country to do or not do things. 
And in particular, regarding the League of Nations, there is some work that has been done by Jan de Corsan and Juan Flores that showed that this institution also play an important role in facilitating access by Eastern countries and some countries in the Balkans to financial to capital market. So I wonder, how does this financial dependence play place in your story? Um, where you thought there was not as use as trade, uh, you know, sanctions and trade uh, by the League of Nations. Uh, that's that's my question. Should we take a hand? Yeah. I think it's enough. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can answer this question. Okay. You can meet for yeah. minutes, but yeah, yeah. leave it to three, five. Okay. No, no, I'll, 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 I'll be short. That's a, a very nice point. Um, so. I do talk uh, about the interaction between sanctions and also the financial programs of the League of Nations, which um, were, of course, a, a big predecessor to what the IMF has ended up um, doing after World War II and the World Bank. Uh, the League of Nations was the first to craft these financial assistance programs, and there were strong conditions attached, and they were definitely seen as a um, way to discipline these governments. But there was one crucial difference, which is that that discipline was a much older way of thinking about financial uh, good behavior and financial orthodoxy. In the 19th century, if you look at 1820s Latin America, you'll see British bankers asking the same of countries in terms of reforms and behavior. Um, and it, this was actually something that private banks were also asking. So there's no state agenda, there's no uh, policy agenda, as it were, to use uh, those, uh, those restrictions or that pressure. Uh, it's very much driven by the incentives of profit making. It's not about international security. And indeed, when there were attempts to combine the League of Nations financial instrument with sanctions and to kind of bring those two groups of policymakers into closer contact, um, it was the financial uh, experts, the financial experts who objected and said, no, 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 we're not involved in politics like geopolitics, international security, border disputes. We just look at balance sheets and profit and loss accounts, right? We're, we're technicians. This is about bookkeeping. Um, uh, and, and so this is something that you still see today. And it's quite uh, striking that this, uh, the use of sanctions against Russia now is the first time that the IMF has taken a serious interest in sanctions as a global economic phenomenon, as a macroeconomic thing that affects the entire world. The IMF before didn't really study sanctions as such. They looked at it when it affected individual countries, but never as a global economic process. Um, also because many of the countries under sanctions, Venezuela, North Korea, Iran, didn't have big enough weight in the world economy to warrant that. But now it's very clear because of Russia's uh, imports in commodity markets uh, that there is a massive ripple effect now they're taking interest. So interestingly, those two groups of uh, experts and those ways of thinking uh, are very um, firewalled for much of the 20th century. Thank you very much. Uh, I uh, First of all, congratulations on the book. I haven't read it, but it's very encouraging from what I heard today, and I'm really interested <laughs> reading it. Also, I like the comparison that you brought. You reflected on the historical period and what it means for us today. And I would like to highlight uh, not only the sanctions on Russia, but the sanctions imposed in the second half of the 20th century on the smaller states from Cuba to Iraq to Syria today and, uh, and many countries. And, and we have seen the scandalous effect of these sanctions that actually they never achieved the intended uh, purpose, uh, which is a policy change. Rather, they had really kind of, if we bring the example of Iraq, uh, a, a, a genocide-like effect on population. And, uh, and, and here I'd like to, uh, to pick the point on legitimacy, your question on legitimacy, and really to question the legitimacy of the sanctions today. Because although they, uh, the stated purpose is uh, to, inform, uh, to enforce respect for human rights or particular uh, international norms, rather what they do is the, the, exactly the opposite. And in the case of Syria today, instead of uh, enhancing respect for human rights, actually they are depriving the population from access to their basic rights, starting from the right to life, right to food, right to medicine, right to education. And these issues have been documented, well documented, by the United Nations Human Rights Office, by the Special Rapporteur on unilateral sanctions, and they always 
highlight the, the ne negative impact of sanctions on population, yet we don't see any change in the way that sanctions are imposed today or in the stated purpose of sanctions. So is there any hope that there would be a revision of the idea of how sanctions are imposed today or used today? And these are, are aren't they becoming like another way of imposing wars on other nations without actually using weapons? Uh, so it's not like time uh, between countries that they are in peace, but actually they are in actual war. I, I think that, yeah, what you point out is, is, is true that, uh, uh, of course, humanitarian effects of sanctions are oftentimes very grievous. Mm -hmm. And um, about whether there's any hope for that today, I mean, I think there are people here who are much better informed on the, on the issue, and particularly within the UN and international organizations on that than I am. But um, I would just say that it's a very... Um, difficult thing because the um, ability to use the sanctions and to enforce them is still concentrated in the hands of a rather small uh, a, a number of countries. And in, because of dollar centralization, it doesn't really matter for the United States if there is or is not multilateral approval for sanctions, right? They can be used with a nearly multilateral like effect, any uh, multilateral like effect. Um, anyway, um, there is some change, I think, because particularly the uh, um, economic size of uh, Asian countries in particular has grown a lot between the 1990s and now. And we can see this in Russia that actually the uh, hermetic uh, way in which uh, Iraq, for example, in the 1990s could be isolated, it's much harder to reproduce that today because there are simply so many more independent economic actors. So the opportunities for, uh, uh, for evasion or for readjustment to it have gone up. But, um, the, I think in general, what we need much more is political uh, science, political economic, uh, anthropological and sociological research also into uh, the way in which sanctions change the countries that they are used against. Uh, because, of course, this has all sorts of effects on uh, the structure of the state and the society. It, it can warp regimes uh, and governments enormously. Um, and I think also, you know, part of the consequences are also that some of the elites there uh, choose to uh, preserve themselves. And so even more of the burden falls on the population, but indeed the, the sanctions do contribute to that. So I don't have any good solutions for it, but I, I think it's an important point for further. Can, can I give a two finger on that? Quick yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's uh, definitely correct that uh, sanctions have like devastating uh, potentially um, effects uh, on people, but I think, um, there's now a greater effort after this wave of kind of like academic literature that's come out. Um, there was already a wave in the 19, late 1990s, early 2000s to move towards like targeted sanctions. And the idea was that instead of targeting populations as a whole, we target the elites and by coercing or pressuring the people who are actually responsible for making this decision, especially in authoritarian regimes where there's no feedback mechanism for people to actually change the way that they're governed. Uh, the hope was that sanctions would, on the one hand, become more effective while minimizing humanitarian impacts. After 2008, um, I think there were a number of factors that led to like the re-strengthening of sanctions, one of them being uh, what Nick talked about, the kind of increased centrality of the U.S. dollar to global financial uh, operations, uh, but also partly as a, I think, consequence of Iraq war and other uh, conflicts around that time. Just like you talk about the First World War, part of the reason the economic weapons adopted in, after First World War is because there's no appetite for warfare in populations and to a degree also within elites. And so I think as long as it's a cheap and easy instrument to go to by policymakers in the U.S. and elsewhere to say we're actually doing something without they themselves or their populations paying a high cost, it's going to, I think, remain very attractive for whoever is capable to use them to actually use them, right? But that said, I think there's been a move recently in Treasury and elsewhere to incorporate this issue. Uh, they actually recently, they're hiring someone to actually start to look at this issue and review it. And our colleague, Erica Moray, who's a part of the kind of sanctions hub, she's not here today, partly because she's kind of summarizing a testimony she gave before Congress precisely on that. So I hope while... I think that we face some grim prospects on the continued use of sanctions in a way that affects human populations around the world. There is some hope for reform. So maybe it's time to take questions in pairs because I see Ariane and somebody behind you. 
Yeah, thank you. So just following up on this humanitarian question, I mean, um, you describe in your book that there was this discussion in the inter interwar period. Can you just briefly describe it and compare what's being discussed on the same topic today? Uh, about uh, the humanitarian impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure you're yeah. Wanted to ask uh, yes, thanks. Um, Sabine Pitlou from the University of Geneva across the river. Uh, just wondering what was the business community thinking of sanction during the interwar period, like the International Chamber of Commerce, because at the same time uh, its director, T.G. Watson, was promoting peace through trade. So I was wondering how we might think of sanction in this context. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, two uh, really great questions. Um, so on humanitarian uh, aspects, uh, there were a lot of international lawyers who were, of course, involved in designing league sanctions, but also were asked to write evaluation and had often happened, right? Politicians decide something at the summit and then it falls to lawyers and, and jurists to sort of hammer out the details, including um, trying to smooth out all the contradictions of uh, clashing policy commitments that the politicians <laughs> have engaged in. And it was very much like that in the interwar period because um, the tendency in international law throughout the 19th century had been towards the greater protection of private property and non-combatants. And that was the uh, march in, if you look at the, the Hague Conventions, for example, 1899 and 1907, they uh, insulate and protect quite a lot of the civilian economy and of civilian society and property from being targeted by war. But sanctions, in order to work precisely, had to be able to threaten everyone. And so there was a big clash between the, the law of conflict resolution uh, and sanctions role in that, and then the humanitarian uh, individual non-combatant protection side of humanitarian law. So actually, I would say that international public law and international humanitarian law clashed in the interwar period. Um, and uh, there were Red Cross discussions also about trying to carve out food shipments, for example, to which some of the sanctions replied, well, that defeats the whole purpose. Unless you also put sanctions on food, you're not ever going to create this terror or deterrent effect. Uh, and, and that's really, they were very open about uh, that they wanted this to be a weapon because they said, if it doesn't do this, it won't deter. Um, and so, yeah, there was a consciously anti humanitarian stance by many sanctionists in this period. Um, and on the business community, um, so that's a, a, again, I think, another. Um, interesting contradiction and this kind of I think these uh, the expression you pose as well about financial experts humanitarian lawyers and the business community can all kind of be grouped under the same phenomenon which is that um, these were all realms of expertise and of, of behavior and also they had they, these communities had ideas of the international order that clashed with the design to make the international order centered around sanctions and um, the sanctionists, however, had very strong political forces behind them, mainly the desire to avoid World War I. So in many cases, uh, business people or the financial expert or the, the uh, jurists had to kind of yield before the political momentum behind this desire for a new instrument. Um, but indeed, the business community tried uh, through the ICC and other organizations to preserve this old uh, kind of laissez-faire idea that you could have interdependence and that that itself would ensure uh, peace. And uh, yeah, the book that was written by Rich Ray right in 1938 is called Merchants of Peace, the first history of the International Chamber of Commerce. So that was the idea. Um, but the sanctionists said actually, well, uh, trading with Nazi Germany doesn't lead to peace. It only gives them more money with which to uh, arm and, and plan for conquest. So increasingly in the 1930s, that was a very a more minority position. Uh, that then was also destroyed by by World War II. Two questions here. Thank you, Professor Mulder, for taking the quick hop over the Atlantic to come engage with us today. I, with some of my other classmates, are in this new class on uh, international sanctions taught by Thomas Biersiger. His focus is more UN targeted sanctions, but over the last three weeks, your, your book and the topic of your book has come up probably in every single class. Um, he's not here today, unfortunately. Right. This past week, just a couple of days ago, we were talking about the effectiveness of sanctions. We revisited Robert Pape's classic work from a few decades ago, you know, why sanctions do not work. I mean, I wonder if you could settle the debate. Okay. I mean, was he too quick to declare that sanctions do not work? And, and so we can report back to the professor, too, next week. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Good. Um, I mean, I just... Uh, 
was wondering if uh, we're confusing two different things here. Uh, I mean, the book is titled The Economic Weapon, and it's the whole idea of it is a deterrence, an alternative to war taken by the League of Nations, by a community of nations to deter war, versus what how it has been applied in the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years, whatever. The reality is, is that it's generally more of an instrument of war. It's uh, used against countries who are not going to invade anybody, Korea, Iraq, Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, for God's sake. It's, it's, not, like the, it's, not, it's not a threat to world peace. So it's uh, used more. So I think maybe we're confusing two different concepts, unilateral sanctions, just the word is similar, where it's used primarily by Western uh, countries. You don't see China or India or Russia imposing sanctions on anybody. And so the predominant sanctions that we've been experiencing in the last 10, 20, 30 years, whatever, forget Russia for now, and even that shows the limits of sanctions as a deterrence of war because anyway all the uh, countries that are capable of actually wait, you know threatening international peace are members of the security council so by definition the united nations cannot impose sanctions that will actually prevent the world war because the ones who can do it are sitting on the thing and they will be to it so the actual sanctions that we do know about and that's what's going on now and i think maybe we're confusing two concepts are more of an instrument of war uh, used primarily, again, by the U.S. Uh, by and its allies as an instrument of coercion, of punishment, just simple punishment. I mean, what Syria is going to do to the rest of the world? Nothing. Uh, just uh, uh, coercion, of, you know, trying to force a certain policy out of it rather than the original concept of... Uh, so I think maybe we just have two different animals here and we just use one word to uh, describe it. Okay. Well, if it's okay, then I'll start with the, with, with your uh, question and then uh, come back. Um, so, um, well, I would question that they haven't that some of those countries haven't done anything because Iraq did invade Kuwait, or um, and there are some other cases also where um, there were clear norms and treaties that were violated. And I think if you care about the implementation of international law, uh, you should acknowledge that there were grounds for the imposition of sanctions. But I agree with you that. The application is not consistent, and I think that that shows also that sanctions um, have, after World War II particularly, entered into this domain where uh, a lot of new international norms have been created, and those are good norms in many cases, but they create problems because a lot of them are about the domestic behavior of states and what the countries can and cannot do with their internal policy, and that creates all sorts of new reasons. Part of the... Um, appeal of the economic weapon of the League of Nations was that it had an incredibly narrow definition for use. The only thing that you could use it for was if one country invaded another. And that, I think, is an important... And the Russian invasion makes that, I think, very relevant. We're kind of, in that sense, back to a very old-fashioned, you know, open and shut that, that there should be an international response. And um, it, it, it's simplified. But you're right that many of these more recent cases are about internal uh, policy uh, they, all, as a result, feel indeed much more driven by ideology also than by consistent um, norm enforcement. Um, and I think that that is, is largely also due to the, the, the power of, of the U.S. and uh, its intention with, but also overlaps sometimes with multilateral sanctions. So um, they are, I, I, I think that you can see them as uh, overlapping circles, uh, unilateral, multilateral sanctions. But it's the large area where there is some overlap um, that's important, but they pull these two things, international, interstate norm enforcement and the enforcement of you know, norms about internal behavior, I think, pull in different directions. Um, and then the question about uh, yeah, the sanctions debate. <laughs> yes. um, so, well, two things. One uh, is that I think if you just want to answer a question on its own terms, I think Pape is, is generally correct. That uh, I mean, his critique of the famous uh, Peterson International Study, uh, Inter Inter Institute for International Economic Study, by um, oh, the names are escaping me right now. But you know, you know the study, yeah, that, yeah, yeah economic yeah. sanctions reconsidered by Hofbauer, uh, Scott, and yeah, um, it was a historical critique, and I think that's why history is important. Um, I also think that the question of do sanctions work as just you know a three-word question, a sort of general principle, is 
utterly misconceived because <laughs> we are now using sanctions, uh, like I said, s since World War II particularly, but today we're using them for so many different ends. That is like asking a question uh, such as, do hammers work? You know, do screwdrivers work? Well, as a general question, it's just not the answer to that is not useful. It's only interesting to ask, do screwdrivers work to open doors or do they work better to, uh, un you know, to turn screws? So um, it's, uh, but, the, but so it lacks specificity, but I think that the way in which international relations and political science and the kind of economics influenced way of thinking in the social sciences uh, is very concerned with large end regressions and with coming up with general uh, statements. Um, but that actually is not even that useful to policymakers because policymakers decide on that, applying this tool rather than another based on the specific situation. So the, the, the way we talk about sanctions, I think that would be my message, needs to be become way more context dependent um, and needs to take way more account also of the particular moment that you're in. And one of the things that history uh, is useful to, uh, to remind ourselves of is that timing really matters. You do not choose the moment in history when you end up in a crisis where you might have to use sanctions. And this year, we're in an economic situation that uh, made it difficult and more painful to use sanctions because energy prices were going up. This benefited Russia, of course, as we've seen since, because it's impossible to drive all Russian exports off the market. So you drive up the price that they get for oil and gas. Uh, so even though you're applying a, a policy consistently in, uh, to defend a good principle, the economic effect of it is actually that you drive up Russian revenue, et cetera. So um, this just shows that it all, it's all about uh, the particular situation. Um, and it doesn't mean that there aren't general lessons to be learned, uh, but, but I think we should get away from this wanting to have a single sentence answer or a percentage of success or something. Uh, it seems to me to not be particularly helpful when we actually look at the world for this. You need to maybe yeah. I'll ask... Uh, uh, so, because I, I wanted to make two comments on the book uh, before uh, um, Nick leaves, uh, uh, I'll give you the floor right after. Um, and I'm sure that Tom may disagree with the answer, so, because Tom has been working a lot on making the answers more nuanced uh, rather than answer it at the general level. I wanted to, to make uh, a couple of comments because I've read the book. Just to complement what Farzana said, to show there's more research that is possible to do, including on the interwar period, after Nick's research. So, you know, it does actually uncover a lot of things. There are still more we can do, and I would encourage uh, history students uh, to do that. Um, first, to specify exactly what book what that book is doing. I think uh, we haven't talked too much uh, here about uh, its uh, impact on uh, or its dialogue with theories of liberalism from the political theory point of view. And I think this book is written maybe, it's because maybe it's written by a historian, so it doesn't therefore his first big monograph to enter the political theory field, but I think more research needs to be done uh, along these lines because it questions what we think about liberalism and economic liberalism in, in a couple of ways. Uh, and there have been two traditions to rethink liberalism and economic liberalism and neoliberalism coming from two different strands of research. One is Foucauldian. And that is, that's where I would include Nick's contribution, because there's something you haven't talked too much about. It's like the, the importance of the shift that the First World War represents in how instruments of knowledge about sanctions have changed. Because before, as you said, economic weapons have been there all the time. You had rockets, you bring boats, you bring police force, you enter the Cops, border guards come in the boats, they check if they have some, can, you know, some illegal goods, etc. It's, a, it's a basically a micromanagement police, a physical. And, and what you describe in your book is the use of statistics and uh, what Foucault would call you know, the sort of uh, new forms of governmentality associated with uh, uh, biosecurity issues with 
that enters the field of sanctions management. It's no longer people who check one boat and the physical things. It's people who think about aggregates. So who thinks about what is the, the normal, and it's about normal and deviance. So very focalian. So what is the normal import of aluminium going to Germany during one time? If we see it's going up, that means more people help them with their war effort. So they want to fix the normal rate of import to that. And, and in a sense, what, what your book does is that it shows how this new, uh, what Foucault uh, calls this sort of uh, biosecurity uh, logic, changes the sort of expert knowledge that is in use in the field of sanction. Hence, the, one of the questions we could ask is, when is the next move? Uh, you know, you, you, the, the period you describe is more or less coherent, but we could trace the story further and ask, you know, in the case of Cuba, it's a very different logic. You're right. You are not thinking, you're just trying to blockade. That's, uh, you don't need an aggregate to find norm and deviant rate. Uh, in the case of Iran, there, there are actually some interesting uh, work, for instance, by Yesvandia, to think about how these new forms of thinking of what would be a rate of inflation that would make certain Iranian policies unsustainable and neighboring regime change have been computed by Treasury in a sense. And so the, the question is really, how can you manipulate those aggregates in enemy countries so that sanctions have the effect, the deterrence effect, or, or actually the attrition effect? So, so the, I think this is a discussion about neoliberalism that your book does that maybe could be highlighted in a separate article. But there's another way to think about liberalism, and I think this is more a conversation you have with Queen Slobodian, not only about centrality of Geneva for the invention of uh, liberalism in the 20th century, because Slobodian looks at the Graduate Institute, you look at Geneva, uh, League of Nations, but it's this association between trade, globalization, and peace, okay? So, and, and that's how we think about liberalism as a good ideology, an ideology for good. It's sustainable peace. And sanctions are actually work to produce sanctionable peace because the more you globalize, the more sanctions will have a deterrent effect. Because if the world is very integrated, you don't want to be out of that world because it's completely integrated, so you don't want to be me, myself, and I against the world. Whereas if it's two blocks, you don't care You're part of your block. So globalization has been seen as an instrument of peace. But actually, you were, we could wonder if in the thinking of some of these uh, uh, liberals, there's not a weaponization of globalization, and that actually globalization is seen as actually one step to actually achieve the militarization of economic policies. And once you get the world to be globalized, then you can impose on other countries, your own preferred domestic policies, etc. So it would be interesting to find who are the clouds bits of economic uh, liberalism. Uh, and this is, a, so these are two discussions that I think are sort of implicit in the book, because mm -hmm. it, it, it's a book of a historian, so very, very carefully written about all the, the instruments, the people, the, uh, the administration in charge. But it would, be, it would be interesting to have a political theorist discuss the book, and maybe next time that's what we'll do. Absolutely. And, and now, uh, uh, just to say one thing uh, about actually the, you know, the, this dream that with globalization uh, uh, you would achieve a, a sort of automatic effect of sanction, I think actually that the Iran sanctions have shown that it's not the case. That actually having OFAC alter sanction is not enough. <clears throat> what mattered were the deferred prosecution agreements, the conditionalities upon, imposed upon global banks. So sanctions don't work by having OFAC put somebody on an exclusion list and then the whole world will be scared, oh, and this will shadow. This is the story they tell themselves. But if you want to tell the real story of how sanctions started to have an effect, you have to look at the conditionalities that were no longer involved like the IMF on states, but on multinationals. 
And it's through these different prosecution agreements, these forms of contracts that are imposed by one hegemon with multinationals, that suddenly, basically, it's no longer sanctioned. It's new contractual conditionalities that multinationals agree to abide by in order to be able to trade in the hegemon, very much like, in a sense, what the British were doing in the late 19th century by having some form of border to say, if you want to bring your corn in, uh, in uh, the UK, you will have to abide by these standards and will have uh, the, the, the cases settled in, under British law. Uh, it was under British court, and now it's under US executive negotiation because you have to deal with the Department of Justice, which is part of the executive, not in court. And all this is contracted out of court. So it's a different type of globalization arrangement, or uh, governance arrangement than the British. <coughs> There's some analogy, which brings me to my third and last comment, which is what more research can be done. There is one thing that doesn't appear in the book, which deals much a lot with the, the, the forms of, you know, the knowledge making practices associated with sanctions at the league, but not on the vocabulary on sanctions. And that's where your question about, you know, are we talking about the same things? Exactly. Or the category error, it seems like when you discuss just sanctions, there are sanctions as a weapon. The economic weapon as a deterrence done by multinational, by the UN or whatever, and sanctions are as applied by a hegemon who can only be the one who can apply them based on, you know, simple, like I said, contractual things and stuff. And it's an instrument of, it's an instrument of war, of coercion, of policing, of whatever. It's sort so of two third, different categories. There's a third uh, uh, meaning of sanction. It's like from the legal language, if you think about the legal language, basically sanctions are uh, 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 basically a, a remedy to bring back what should be the normal situation under certain law after some violations are observed. And this is a very you know, minimalist understanding of sanctions. You, you apply sanctions when the violations of an existing law has been observed, and that's how today China or Russia and the UN Security Council would consider it. Uh, the US and others consider that it's broader. In the time, in our period, sanctions appear a lot in colonial law. And why? Because colonial law or code de l'indigena or other types of colonial uh, uh, legislation doesn't assume that colonial subjects have rights in bill of rights. So in these codes, they say, these people need to do that and that. And if they don't, there will be sanctions. Okay? So for instance, typically, uh, for instance, the French Congo uh, or other countries, uh, other colonies, there is forced labor. A third of the time of the population needs to be given to the metropolis to build, build roads, etc. If they don't, then they cut hands. They bring men, they bring women into slave camps until the men get out to actually work. These are sanctions. They are established by specific codes. And this is a, a, a genealogy of the legal term. And here I'm not saying that the type of things you're studying is this, but if we're looking at, if we want to do a genealogy of the legal term, I think we need to go to the Start colonial codes yeah. and to the colonial governments, because that would explain a lot why suddenly, you know, some it's parents useful decide reference. to think, okay, mm -hmm. this is what these populations need to do, and if they don't do it, they'll be sanctioned. And we decide both what they, the normative behaviors they need to follow and the sanctions that we will apply against them. So, so I think you know, the, the articulation between this colonial mode of governance and the League of Nations mode of governance, it's still obscure. And I think you know, a lot of history work needs to be done to understand better this articulation. So these were my comments as a, as a way I don't no, if we have time for a last question, maybe you could ask your question in the, after the, uh, because uh, Nick is going to be here a little bit more. I give the last words to Nick, and uh, you have five minutes. <laughs>
Well, then maybe we should ask us one more question. I think, and then I'll be really short if that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> if your answer, if your question yes. is. Um, so in the Iraq case, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, sanctions, multilateral sanctions were imposed because the purpose was to restore regional peace and security. This scenario is repeated in the Russian-Ukraine war, where sanctions, multilateral sanctions are imposed. But one can also argue that the U.S. invaded Iraq and there were no multilateral sanctions. Can one argue that sanctions in our modern world have become an instrument to serve the political interest of certain powerful countries rather than the, an instrument to be used to restore peace and security? Yeah, um, I, I totally agree. And, uh, it's the fact that um, in uh, 1990, uh, the U.S. and the Soviet Union were, and, and Gorbachev and, and, and George W. Bush were on good enough terms that they actually had a similar assessment of what happened in the Middle East. Um, and that then there was no veto on the Security Council. Therefore, the international time to put into that. But exactly now, Russia and China can block sanctions. Um, so multilateral sanctions are a, a great power uh, brokered affair, uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, um, so, um, I mean, I, lo I loved your, uh, your, your comments, um, I, I will just, I think the ob observation that it's Foucauldian view of liberalism um, is correct, and there is an argument in the book about the, um, which is also in conversation with uh, studies like Tim Mitchell, for example, about the invention of the economy as a thing. Because in the 19th century, um, economic life and economic interdependence does not follow national borders, and governments don't have a lot of knowledge or control over it. And one of the ways in which the, the modern policymaking starts to find the national uh, economy, we have a story about how the Great Depression does that, because that's when we have to solve things like unemployment and inflation. But I would argue that the actual border uh, understanding um, also happens partially in, in World War One as a result of the enormous amount of information generated by the blockade ministries. Um, and that's the kind of actual fuel, the raw material flows uh, are understood by them. Um, and then it's in the 1930s that that finds domestic applications as a way of generating recovery from the Great Depression. So there's an interesting way in which, yes, the, also the story that we tell maybe about things like the Keynesian revolution have an earlier um, security uh, story behind them, actually, uh, that involves warfare. Um, and not World War II then, but, but World War I uh, also. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, uh, who is the Clausewitz of, <laughs> of economic liberalism? I think that's a really uh, extremely sharp way of, of putting it, and you're right that there are definitely people who like to advance interdependence precisely so as to exert control over it. However, I think that on the whole, the biggest argument that you hear among liberals is ultimately one that is kind of depoliticized and is about the gains economically. And, and it's kind of, you could read it more in class terms or in terms of uh, a kind of private uh, interest. Um, what they want most of all is to become very rich and to be left alone. <laughs> and to not have there be international conflicts that cause, uh, you know, obstacles for the accumulation of, of wealth under globalized capitalism. I think that's the way to read the class interest of interwar liberal internationalists. Uh, and it's, you know, something that they are also quite open about. And, um, and that was also the model and the way of thinking that came out of the 19th century. Um, but the, I think the, the danger for them is that when you advance globalization, and this is indeed something that the United States is experiencing too, yes, it does give you these new levers to be used, but it, but it, it is very difficult to advance it asymmetrically. Almost always there, you still also increase your own uh, vulnerability to certain counteractions, right? And I think the big example here, and, and this is, I think, uh, what the United States has been doing now for several years. Why is there now such a large bipartisan consensus on um, containing China? I think this has a lot to do with the fact that the United States um, had uh, gained a lot of benefits over the last 40 years from uh, letting China into its own uh, globalization model. Uh, it benefited both American elites and uh, Chinese uh, elites and Chinese, uh, the Chinese national economy in many ways. Um, 
But I think that they've understood that it also has given China rather large uh, levers uh, over, it, lever over the United States in certain areas. Um, and, and so that is like, even though there are economic clauses that it seems at OFAC, <laughs> um, there, what they are, I think, aware of is that there are uh, vulnerabilities in the United States. That, and that, that's how I would read the attempt to, to with the CHIPS Act, uh, home shore uh, semiconductor, um, and also about the foreign investment screening, these sorts of things. Um, so, um, yeah, it's difficult to have it only happen on your terms. That's, that's kind of, and so in that sense, I consider globalization still to be something that is above any one state. It's not a project of any one country. It actually, its effects always escape the power of even the most uh, potent nations, let's say. Um, yeah, and then I, I agree with you on the, the sanction colonial law genealogy that, um, that I would be fascinating to, uh, to uh, read more research about that. And, uh, I think that's, that's very difficult. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you so much for everybody for being here. And uh, we'll see you for next sanctions event soon. Great. Thank you.